Good afternoon, damas y caballeros, amigos. My name is Maria Cardona. I'm a democratic strategist and a principal at the Dewey Square Group and Latin Ovations here in Washington, D.C., and I will serve as your moderator today, and it's my great honor to do so. <laughs> Thank you. We are delighted you could join us today for Maldives 2010 Latino State of the Union, the third annual roundtable on law, policy, and civil rights, and to welcome Tom Sands back to Maldives. Founded in 1968, Maldif is the nation's leading Latino legal civil rights organization, often described, and rightly so, as the law firm of the Latino community. Maldif promotes social change through advocacy, communications, community education, and litigation in the areas of education, employment, immigration rights, and political access. Maldif stands firm in promoting and protecting the rights of Latinos by advising our nation's leaders on the challenges faced in the areas of the judiciary, public policy, and civil rights. Tom Sands will share a few words with us in a bit, followed by a roundtable discussion with our nation's leading Latino thought leaders. But right now, I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the Maldiv board members and corporate sponsors that made today's roundtable possible. Please hold your applause until I finish. Corporate sponsors include our friends at Comcast, Walmart, and AT&T. Our board members include Tom Reston and Mickey Ibarra. You can applaud now. <laughs> now it's my great honor to take this opportunity to introduce a special guest and a very good friend of Maldives, Congressman Javier Becerra. First elected to the House of Representatives in 1992, Congressman Becerra serves as the Vice Chair of the House Democratic Caucus and is a senior member of the powerful Committee on Ways and Means. His committee is responsible for formulating our nation's tax, social security, Medicare, trade, and income security laws. As Vice Chairman of the Democratic Caucus, Congressman Becerra wields a strong voice in House leadership helping to set priorities and drive the legislative decision-making process. We really appreciate your strong voice, Congressman, and we appreciate your being here with us today. Please join me in giving Congressman Becerra a warm welcome. Maria, thank you very much. And if uh, your visibility on the tube is any sign of the Latino State of the Union, then we are doing very, very well. To Maria and, of course, to Tom Sines and all of the people who make it work at Maldiv and make it work for us when it comes to the halls of justice, we say thank you very much for being there for all of us as Americans, not just as Latinos, but all Americans for standing up for the constitutional civil rights of each and every one of us, whether we are citizen or not, whether we are, whether, whether we are wealthy or not, or whether we are simply trying to live the American dream of peace and prosperity. We say thank you to Maldiv each and every day. Now I was wondering, as I was getting ready to come up here yesterday, thinking about coming up, I was thinking, I wonder if it might have been better for me to talk about the state of the Latino Union before yesterday. Uh, and I must tell you, the state of the Union for Americans of Latino descent is going to be good today. It's going to be good tomorrow, regardless of what happens yesterday. What happened yesterday, because we are going to make our future. We will determine our prosperity by what we do as a people who are proud to be Americans in the United States of America. And so, and so, if you ask me, in 2010, what is the state of the Union for Latinos? I say to you, buy stock in Latinos. <laughs> Almost to the minute a year ago today, Barack Obama was being sworn in 
under far different conditions weather-wise than we see today. Within that year, when the president said, I want to do something for kids, Congress acted quickly and passed state children's health care legislation, which made it possible for 4 million new children to receive health care, among them Latino immigrant children. When, when the president came into office saying, we need to do something to get ourselves out of the ditch that we've been run into economically, Congress responded with the first major piece of legislation called the Economic Recovery and Reinvestment Package, which has set us on a course far different from what the president inherited. And when the president said we need to do something for education in America, for our kids who go to school, we passed legislation which makes it much more affordable for your children and my three girls to go to college by increasing the size of Pell Grants and making college loans far more affordable to each and every American family in this country. And so right away, investments were made by this president. But much is yet to be done for Latinos in America. You cannot utter one other word after having said that without saying the word, the words immigration reform. We must have immigration reform, not because we want it, but because this country needs it, and this president promised it. We must have an accurate count of the census, and here Maldif will be indispensable working with all the Latino organizations to make sure that every single person in this country, including every single Latino, gets counted so we have an accurate depiction of who is in this country and who we are as a country. And we must also continue to make further investments in education. We know all of that. So I will say this to you. As you prepare to hear the reports on the status of Latinos in America and the state of Latino America, I say to you this. Be bullish. Be optimistic. And always, as my father said to me, be prepared to get up in the morning and go to work. Because so long as you have a job and you can go to work, it's a good day. And so 2010 will be a good year for Latinos because guess what? Latinos have always been ready to get up to go to work. And we will do it again in 2010 for the American people and for all Latinos who believe that America really does deliver on the promise of the dream for us all. Thank you very much. Enjoy the report because it will talk about optimism and what we must do to make it possible for all of our children to dream in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman Becerra, and thank you so much for all of your work on behalf of our community. Before I introduce our next speaker, I'd like to acknowledge Congressman Ben Lujan, who I understand is joining us here today. Congressman, if you're here, could you please stand up? No? <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> next time when he comes. Uh, and now I would like to introduce MALDEF board member Tom Reston, and he will give us the introduction for Mr. Tom Sines. Welcome to everyone. In politics, if you don't get it right at the beginning, it's not likely to come true at the very end. The purpose of the exercise must inform the strategy of maneuver. In this city, in its latter days, this rule of politics has too often been forgotten or broken. And that is why the Mexican American Legal Defense and Educational Fund has been pleased to uh, organize this meeting today as we have organized similar meetings in the past. Our agenda is a very long one and a very particular one and a very specific one. But in this particular year, we will once again, and now with an increased sense of urgency, speak to an even larger question as well. We, in this community, 
have been the ones who have insisted that the nation must turn its attention to the appalling chaos which the government, in its distraction and trepidation, has allowed to develop in the shadows of our national life, the immigration chaos. We have done this because we profoundly believe that out of this chaos, we can fashion something which will strengthen our country. What we have begun, we must now see through to the end. It will be a task for politics, of course, but this is about something more than politics. This is about the meaning of America. For this task, what will we require, first of ourselves and then also of the nation? So much. Yet here at the outset, I will mention only one thing. We will insist that we ourselves and the country at large be serious about these questions. I have been asked today to introduce our keynote speaker, Tom Sines, the new president and general counsel of the Mexican American Legal Defense and Educational Fund. Tom Sines comes out of the courts. He is a litigator. He has chosen to use what is one of the most brilliant legal minds of his generation in the service of justice to the Latino community. And if you seek the evidence for that statement, you can find it all about you in the restructured school systems, in the smashed up, cozy political arrangements of insiders, in the bigotry on the factory floor thwarted and checked and set to rights. But will he understand what we do in Washington? Will he understand Washington? As it happens, I have, it has been my luck to know Tom Sines well for going on two decades, nearly two decades now. I have watched him closely. I have sat with him in defeat. I have rejoiced with him in his many victories. I have seen him at the very end. And more to the point for this particular day, I have observed him also at the beginning of a fight, laying his groundwork, marshalling his ideas, setting his traps, listening quietly, focusing his finely tuned political lens on the battles to come. The point I want to bring across to you today is this. He is a man who is utterly serious about what he does. Tom Sines understands this city and the way it works. And thus, we are going to find out in this coming year that he will be a mighty voice and a mighty mind to help frame the debates which we are about to have. He may be from California, yet on good knowledge, I can tell you proudly and confident, confidently and emphatically, he is from Washington, D.C. as well, Tom Sines. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this third annual Latino State of the Union event. I want to thank each and every one of you for being here, and I want to thank the distinguished panelists from whom you will hear shortly. With this third annual State of the Union, and each passing year in the growth and geographic dispersion of our Latino community, it becomes ever more clear that the state of the Latino Union is more and more predictive of the state of our entire union. As has already been noted one year ago today, 
we celebrated the inauguration of our first African-American president and welcomed a broader change in the leadership of our federal government. This change was not just an achievement of the entire nation, but an achievement of the Latino community because we voted in unprecedentedly large numbers and in critical states for that change in government. In many ways, these Latino votes, a little over a year ago, were a down payment, one of many ongoing payments, because so many of us have been a part of this nation for generations. A down payment on owning and shaping a part of the home that is the United States. And we as a community have been waiting for escrow to close on that home in America for over a year. In this context, the closing of escrow means making this nation the permanent home for the many millions who have, without legal status or protections, contributed to the growth of our economy and our society. 2010 is the year when we expect our payments to result in creating that permanent home through comprehensive immigration reform. We have for decades engaged in national self-congratulation on changing in 1965 our immigration system from a self-consciously racist system designed to benefit European immigrants to one that, while more equitable, still results in dramatically divergent waiting periods to immigrate legally based entirely on one's nation of origin. The home that we in the Latino community secured with our votes and our sweat equity has no place for an unfinished system of still discriminatory quotas for admission to this nation. And so in 2010, we expect our national leaders to finish the job begun in 1965 by reforming our system of immigrant admissions, including recognizing that families, however they are defined in 2010, must remain the foundation of immigration to this nation. We expect our national leaders to recognize the injustice of our current system by providing a permanent home to those who have toiled without fair recognition or legal protection, by providing a path to permanent residency and citizenship. We expect our national leaders to acknowledge the wisdom of our constitutional design by preventing for all time states and localities acting under the worst impulses of populist pressures from continuing to enact punitive schemes of restriction directed at immigrants. We expect our national leaders to create a fair and just future scheme of immigration enforcement that depends on a well-regulated and openly governed federal law enforcement force that acts consistently in a manner that is true to our constitutional values of due process and equal protection. But we expect more. We also expect our national leaders not to create false choices by acquiescing in the notion that addressing immigration reform must somehow squeeze out or unduly delay the pressing necessity of saving our environment or fixing our health care delivery system. The home that we have purchased with our votes and our sweat equity has a need and the room for all of these to be solved. We also expect our national leaders to invest in the future of our home through the reauthorization of a well-funded and carefully crafted elementary and secondary education act that builds on the legislation of last decade through aggressive measures to address the achievement gap yearly reflected in divergences in subgroup performance. Perhaps most important, we expect our national leaders to reject the division that is fostered by those who through racist and xenophobic vitriol seek to divert our shared national interests. Whether in the form of a Congress member's unprecedentedly rude outburst, or a talk radio pundit's disinformation, or an Arizona sheriff's racist policies, this rhetoric has no place in our home, America, and no room in that home for accommodating these rants. 
our nation. Our nation has a regrettably long history at the highest levels of demonizing and dehumanizing Latino people in the service of national goals. But these messages from national leaders are no more acceptable in the context of needed legislative reform than in the context of justifying manifest destiny and wars of conquest. Singling out the immigrant community through unprecedented restrictions of contractual purposes, purchases of unsubsidized health insurance, restricting access to health care in the context of new mandates on the basis of birthplace alone, and according unequal treatment to those residing in Puerto Rico are simply new signals of demonization of our community, and they are as unacceptable today as they were in the 19th century. We expect our national leaders to reject such accommodations of those who coarsen our national discourse with misinformation and intolerance. This is what we expect of our national leaders. In a few short months, through our collective efforts to ensure that everyone understands that it is safe, simple, and critically important to be counted, our decennial census will indicate to the nation once more how many Latinos call this nation home and daily invest in this home through hard work and high intellect. Our community's participation in the census will be one more payment for the kind of home in America that we have the right to demand and reason to expect. In 2010, when too many of our community members and others throughout the nation have, despite making down payments and ongoing payments, lost their homes because of an economic calamity, we need to make clear with a strong voice and unified participation that the payments through sweat equity that we have made in the Latino community, that the down payment that we made over a year ago in our votes will not result in our losing this home. We expect those payments to result in the kind of home, the kind of America that we have a right to expect and demand. 2010 is the year that we expect our national leadership to deliver the kind of America that we all hope for and have contributed to. All of you, together with Maldef and our many allies, will contribute to ensuring that the home that we have worked so hard for, that we have paid so often for, is finally achieved in America. Thank you all again for being here this afternoon. Thank you so much, Tom. Maldif is so lucky to have you at the helm. One other applause for Tom. Our next guest has worked to establish himself as an effective legislator and energetic spokesman, not just on behalf of his constituents in Illinois' 4th District, but indeed on behalf of the entire Latino community in this country. As the first Latino to be elected to Congress from the Midwest, Congressman Gutierrez sought opportunities to address long-standing needs facing the immigrant community in his diverse congressional district, which is home to Chicago's large and established communities of immigrants from Eastern Europe, as well as Latin America. Because of the Congressman's outstanding work on immigration issues, he was appointed as chair of the Democratic Caucus Immigration Task Force where he is the party's leading strategist and spokesperson on immigration issues. And as the chair of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Immigration Reform, or Immigration Task Force, um, he, he, he uses that voice very strongly on our behalf. In December 2009, Gutierrez introduced the Comprehensive Immigration Reform for America's Security and Prosperity Act. Legislation that secures our nation's economy, keeps families together, and secures our borders while fixing our incredibly broken immigration system. 
Congressman Gutierrez also chairs the powerful Financial Services Subcommittee on Financial Institutions and Consumer Credit. It is my honor to introduce to you a terrific friend of the Latino community, of an American families everywhere, Congressman Luis Gutierrez. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much um, to everyone at MALDEF, and to Tom, and to all of the leadership here. Um, I thought it was going to be a panel, but I don't see any other panelists. So <laughs> I'll, I'll try to use my five minutes um, as best as possible. A couple of things. The last time we introduced comprehensive immigration, we did it in a bipartisan manner the last three times, actually. And when it was failing in the Senate, and I turned to the broad-based community organizations across this country, they kind of said, it's really not our bill, Luis. You know, it's your bipartisan bill. And it was when it was dying in the Senate, no one came uh, to help. Because they really didn't feel a sense of connection and ownership with the bill. So we introduced it in a bipartisan manner with 13 members. Well, before we left on recess, we introduced a new comprehensive immigration reform bill. But it's a comprehensive reform bill in which many people in this room participated in the drafting. And so when it was introduced, whether people were in LA or in San Francisco or in Chicago or Miami or in Chicago, they were celebrating the bill and support for the bill. And it has 92 original sponsors of the bill, not 13. Yes, they're all Democrats, but there's 92 of them. Because one of the things you have to always remember, and I remember um, Harold Washington was the first African-American mayor of the city of Chicago. And he used to always tell me, never forget the base. And uh, you know, sometimes we forget the base. We try to expand so much to be so inclusive and to bring so many people under the tent that we forget the base. And when you forget the base, guess what happens? The tent falls right on top of you. We didn't forget the base this time when we introduced the bill. Uh, we made sure that they were. So that bill, we're going to meet tomorrow morning so that we expand and we get to 100 and past 100 and we continue. And I think it's time that we demand hearings. I mean, you have a bill and the Democratic majority and you have 92 people. We have uh, Conyers, who's the chairman of judiciary, is on the bill. And I wanted to also tell you, because I think it's very important here at MALDEF, given the rich history that MALDEF has in working to coalesce with Asians and African Americans and other diverse groups here in America, that uh, two thirds of the Black Caucus are original co sponsors of the bill. I mean, if you think of LA, you think of Maxine Waters, right? And she's on the bill. And and if you think of Detroit, you think of Conyers, he's on the bill. And if you think of New York, you think of Charlie Rangel, and he's on the bill, or Yvette Clark. Go look at it a moment, and you will see the richness uh, that the bill, it's a bill that we have to work for. You know, people ask me, they say, well, Luis, you know, because, you know, it's the, it's the elephant that's in the room, right? Everybody's going, pero Luisito ya anoche, no pasó algo en Massachusetts que quizá. <laughs> right? You're all thinking, right? You know, I didn't get to Washington, D.C. yesterday. You know, I've been here a few years. Yeah, I thought about it. But you know what first occurred to me? A couple of things that occurred to me. Number one, we didn't have 60 Democrats on comprehensive immigration reform before the election yesterday. So I never, we never had 60 Democrats, okay? We've always said that we need Republican support to pass comprehensive immigration reform, and we have to make sure that we have our base sufficiently solidified and behind the proposal that they will move on those Republicans and tell them to do the right thing, or then maybe their elections are in jeopardy. And if we don't mobilize and organize our community, we'll never have the vote. So we didn't have 60 yesterday, hay 59. Yo me imagino que los mismos demócratas que iban a votar con nosotros ayer van a votar con nosotros hoy. Así que, número uno. And last time I checked in the House, we have the same majority. Uh, that we had yesterday, we have to do. So let's move forward. That's number one. Number two, it was almost as though, did Kennedy's, you mean the man spent 50 years here and one election, his legacy is gone? En la mente de quien cabe eso? 
yo voy a continuar trabajando en el legado que hizo el senador Kennedy cuando se firme esa reforma, entonces su legado se ha cumplido. No como unas elecciones que se celebran en Massachusetts. If we here in Washington, D.C. send a message back to our base that somehow we're afraid, that somehow we're disillusioned, that somehow we're taking a step backward, that's the wrong message. We have to send them the correct message, and that is that we're going to fight. I didn't wake up any less determined this morning than I was yesterday in terms of getting, because the need is exactly the same, if not greater today, than it was yesterday. And lastly... Look, for those of us who have traveled throughout this country and met with women who are in sweatshops in L.A. or met with women that I met um, picking garlic and strawberries in California who every day are not only exploited in terms of their wages but in, exploited also because there are women by unscrupulous men that exploit them sexually every day, their ex exploitation. It's like part of the dark thing that we don't talk about um, in immigration. You're going to tell me less people are going to die? No, more people are going to die. More families are going to be broken. And so the issues that drive us to bring about comprehensive immigration reform are still there, and I'm just as committed to getting it done. We've got 92, we're gonna get up to 100. It's time to press our Democratic leadership. If we don't get this bill done, then Democrats will be doomed, I believe, from a perspective, because guess what? They're talking to their base. You know who didn't come out to vote yesterday? The millions of people in New Jersey and in Virginia and in Massachusetts, the millions of people that we got out because we inspired them to vote because we gave them hope that America could be a richer, fairer place for all of us to live in. Y si nosotros le mandamos el mensaje que no hay tiempo para ello, entonces ellos lo que van a hacer lo siguiente, creo yo. Van a decir, no tiene tiempo para mí, entonces para qué yo voy a tener tiempo para ti el día de las elecciones. Yo quiero salir a votar para aquellas personas que cumplen con su palabra. Y nosotros tenemos que cumplir. Aún en la derrota es mejor dar la pelea que huir en el campo de batalla. Nosotros no podemos huir este campo de batalla. So, I want to tell you that I'm going to go back, work. I look forward. We got a great coalition. I'm very excited about where I saw my friend Javier. I know he's probably gone. We've, we've worked for a long time together, um, and we're going to work on getting this done. I'm going down to Miami this weekend. We're going to meet with some folks in Miami. So if there's any folks from Miami, call the office. I'd love to see you down there where it's a little warmer. And then we're going out to L.A. next weekend. We're going to meet with all the community groups. We've got the L.A. Uh, AFL-CIO convention on Tuesday. I, does it, I haven't changed my schedule. I haven't changed my itinerary. I'm not a person who likes to waste his time. I'm going to go out and keep traveling throughout this country and keep energizing the base to get this done. Muchísimas gracias por permitirme el uso de este micrófono. I would like to introduce my good friend, Susan Gonzalez, Vice President of the Comcast Foundation. Comcast is one of today's sponsors and has an important message about the census to share with us today. Hello. Hi. Thanks, Maria. All right. We have the troopers at state. Thank you so much. So I want to acknowledge MALDEF and their leadership with the census. We've been hearing a lot about it, and I don't know about you, but all I know is it was something we're supposed to do, and you're supposed to fill out this form, and you just do it. And I've actually learned a lot in the next in the last few months. And the census, they talk a lot about the big dollars, the billions of dollars that this means for everybody. But what I've learned resonates with me and might resonate with you is that what it really comes down to is about $1,300 per person. And so when we share, when I've noticed when I share that with my family and they, they get it, they get it when I explain that, you know that pothole you don't like driving down the street every single day? That's the kind of thing that this fixes. You know, you think you need a new school in your district, that this might help for that reason as well. 
So I would just ask everybody to share those messages that resonate with our family members and even more so in some respects with the voter registration. Now is the time for us to really have a voice and to get everybody to sign up with the census. So to Maldives credit, uh, David Damien and I and Tom and Ingrid and Catherine were brainstorming on what could we do this year and the census, uh, with the census effort, and Maldef was recognizing Eva Longoria as one of their um, awardees in LA. And so the Maldef folks said, hey, she would be happy, we're sure, to be your campaign or our campaign spokesperson. And so Eva, of course, being the community advocate that she is, stepped up to the plate and said, absolutely, be happy to do so. So what we're going to do today is preview one of the PSAs. Um, Eva taped two of them in partnership with the Census Bureau. We also have some Spanish language ones with Lupe Antiveros and Jose Jose. And then we're also working with the Census Bureau to post on video on demand uh, tutorials in 59 languages. We'll be launching this with a big announcement um, around the end of February when the Census launches their 1-800 line. But this effort will run for two solid months across the entire cable industry with not only Comcast, but Time Warner, Cox, Charter, a number of lifetime TV. So on any given day, this sense, this PSA and the other PSAs will be seen in up to, I don't know, 40, 30, 40 million homes. And that's because of Maldives' uh, commitment to creating this partnership with us and us really being interested on behalf of Comcast to creating a census outreach campaign. So with that, we will preview the PSA and you'll hear more about it when we launch next month. Our participation in the 2010 census determines how funds will be used to support preschools, educational programs, and build new schools, and to support maternal and child health care, and improve our highways, bridges, and roads. Your participation in the census will help create job training programs and help improve emergency and disaster recovery services. The 2010 Census. It's easy, it's important, and it's safe. Visit 2010census.gov or call 1-866-872-6868. And that's it. That's one of the uh, PSAs. So we look forward to, uh, look for these, they'll be out. There's this one which the Census Bureau calls a motivation PSA, and that is to educate, or the awareness P at PSA, to make everybody aware that this is coming. And then there will be another one that Eva and the others taped that will uh, launch closer to when people actually get their form, and that's a motivation PSA, which the message is more about, it takes 10 minutes, 10 questions, and it's so easy to do. So again, uh, Maldef, thank you so much for partnering with us on this, and we look forward to uh, future campaigns. Thanks. Thank you, Susan. And now I'm going to introduce our terrific panelists today so that we can get going with this very interesting discussion. As I mention you, I will read a short bio, but if you could start proceeding to uh, be seated so that we can be ready to go. First, I'd like to say uh, Tom Sines is going to be uh, joining us on the panel, our fearless leader. I'm very excited about that. Thank you, Tom. Next, we have Joaquin Avila, who is the executive director of the National Voting Rights Advocacy Initiative and distinguished practitioner in residence at Seattle University School of Law. Mr. Avila's area of expertise is in racial and ethnic minority voting rights and has over 30 years of litigation experience in this area, including arguments before various federal circuit courts of appeals and the United States Supreme Court. Mr. Avila's achievements include many awards and citations. In 1996, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation selected Mr. Avila as a MacArthur Fellow for his work in the voting rights area. We're very happy to have him here today. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Gabriela Lemus, who is the Senior Advisor and Director of the Office of Public Engagement at the Department of Labor. She was the first woman to hold she was the first woman to hold uh, the executive director position at the Labor Council for Latin American Advancement and also the first woman to chair the National Hispanic Leadership Agenda. 
By invitation for both the Clinton and the Bush administrations, she was invited to travel to Latin America to give lectures on democracy and civil participation. Dr. Lemus is an outspoken advocate for Latino issues as well as a U.S. Latin American relations and has appeared in dozens of media outlets including CNN, C-SPAN, and MSNBC. Thanks for being here with us, Gabby. <laughs> and then we have Lillian Rodriguez Lopez, who is the president of the Hispanic Federation, a nonprofit organization which now serves nearly 100 Latino health and human service agencies on the East Coast. Under her leadership, the Hispanic Federation dramatically increased its organizational capacity, enabling it to better respond to the needs of the Latino community. Ms. Lopez is also currently chair of the National Hispanic Leadership Agenda and serves as a member of the Citizens Union, the Wells Fargo Wachovia Bank Community Board, the News Corporation Diversity Council, the Nielsen Company Latino Advisory Board, and the Friends of the National Museum uh, of the American Latino. In 2008, People in Español named her one of the 15 most influential Latinos in the United States. Thanks for being here with us, Lillian. And now we welcome Dr. Mark Hugo Lopez, is the Associate Director of the Pew Hispanic Center, where he studies the political engagement of Latinos, Hispanics, and the criminal justice system Latinos and their experience with the economic downturn, and Latino youth. Mr. Lopez also helps coordinate the center's national surveys. Additionally, he currently serves as a visiting professor at the University of Maryland's School of Public Policy, as the second vice president of the American Society of Hispanic Economists, and as a member of the American Economic Association's Committee on the Status of Minority Groups in the Economics Profession. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Lopez. Thank you. And before we get started with our panel discussion, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Lopez for a presentation on these important issues. Thank you very much. Actually, if I can stand yes, right there, absolutely. that'd be great. Um, again, my name's Mark Hugo Lopez, and I'm the Associate Director of the Pew Hispanic Center. I'm sure all of you are aware of the Pew Hispanic Center and its focus, but the Pew Hispanic Center, just to reiterate, is what we call a fact tank. It's an organization that studies Latinos in the United States, but we are nonpartisan. We take no positions. Today, what I want to show you are some facts, some basic facts about what's been happening with the Latino community over the last, frankly, 10 years, because it's been a, a decade of tremendous change and tremendous advancement as well. So next slide, please. First, as you know, the Hispanic population has grown 11-fold uh, since 1950. There's been a tremendous amount of growth in the Hispanic population. Today, about 47 million Hispanics live in the U.S., and that's about 16% of the U.S. population. By our projections at the Pew Hispanic Center, next slide, we project that by 2050, there will be about 128 million Hispanics, representing almost a third of the U.S. population. Now, a lot of this growth, next slide, please, a lot of this growth has has traditionally been in places in the US that are places like California, places like the New York, New Jersey area, and South Florida, and Texas. But as we move forward in time, next slide, one of the interesting demographic things that you see happening with Hispanics is not only has there been growth, but there's been dispersion as well. Next slide, please. Uh, Hispanics, Hispanic populations have grown in virtually every county of the United States, next slide, between 2000 and 2007. There is virtually no county, actually 3,000 of the 3,100 counties in the U.S. have seen growth in the number of Hispanics living in those counties between 2000 and 2007. So while California, Los Angeles County particularly, has almost 10% of all Hispanics in the U.S., we're seeing growth in Montana, we're seeing growth in Alaska, we're seeing growth in Hawaii. Next slide, please. One of the other things about Hispanics and the population that makes it really unique is that it is very young. Uh, if you take a look at these, these are two age pyramids. The age pyramid on, on the left is Hispanics, and you'll see that it looks like a pyramid. That's because there's a lot of young people among Hispanics. When you take a look at the white non-Hispanic population, you'll notice that it's got a bulge. Kind of looks more like a, like a vase, I guess. And the bulge is, of course, the baby boomer population. Now, when we take a look, next slide, please, at Hispanics, native-born versus foreign-born, this is one of the striking things about growth about the Hispanic population. A lot of it is going to be driven by young people, and young people who are born in the U.S. In fact, in this decade, the second generation, that is, children who are born in the United States, but with parents, at least one parent who is foreign-born, 
are actually the driving force behind a lot of growth in the Hispanic population moving forward. And as you move forward, the share foreign born among Hispanics we project will fall from its 40% today to more like 33% by 2050. So it's really this rise of the native born second generation Hispanic, which we're observing. And you can really see it here. Look at how young native born Hispanics are. Next slide. Now, I also wanted to talk about Latino voters because 2008 was an important year for Hispanic voters. Next slide. One of the things that we've seen recently over past, past few election cycles is that more and more Hispanics are voting each and every time. Next slide. You can see this by looking at the number of registered voters and the number of voters overall. You see every election cycle about an additional million and a half, two million Hispanics participating in elections. Now, overall, Hispanics represent about 9% of all voters, yet they represent 16% of the US population. Why such a low share? Well, you all know this, I think. And that's because, partly, they're young. As I was saying earlier, there's a lot of young Hispanics that just can't vote yet. And they're also not US citizens. So you can't vote in a federal election if you're not a US citizen. However, moving forward, over the course of the next 40 years, we're going to see the share of all voters who are Hispanic generally increase, actually increase incrementally each and every election cycle. By 2050, we expect Hispanics, as my colleague says, to be punching at their weight. That is, about 25% of voters in 2050 we expect to be Hispanic. They'll be about 29%, 30% of the US population. So they're kind of getting close to their share of the general population. Next slide. But even though more and more Hispanics are voting, what's happening with those who are eligible to vote? What's, what do we see in terms of participation rates? Next slide. You'll notice that the Hispanic share has, in 2008 was at about half. About half of all Hispanics eligible to vote, to vote actually voted. And what we see is we've seen that since 1996, the share of Hispanics who are eligible to vote, who actually cast a vote, has slowly been rising. It's been rising. Actually, even during times when we saw for whites a slight dip this last election cycle, Hispanics' participation has been rising. Now, you'll notice that one of the things about the last election that was pretty interesting is that blacks and whites look pretty much the same in terms of voter participation. Next slide. The last thing I want to talk about is I want to talk about some recent research that we published about internet use among Hispanics. Because as we move forward, you're going to see that Hispanics are, are in many ways engaging in so many different ways, both online and offline. But I want to talk about, their, about internet use among Hispanics. Next slide. One of the things that we have done at the Pew Hispanic Center is done regular surveys of Hispanics asking them whether or not they use the internet. Do you use the internet? And one of the things we found is we found between 2006 and 2008, the fastest growth in internet use was among Hispanics. In fact, Hispanics have slightly passed up their African-American counterparts in according to our data and data from the Pew Internet and American Life Surveys um, data. Next slide. Now, which Hispanics have seen the biggest growth in terms of use of the internet? Next slide. You'll see that between 2006 and 2008, a lot of the growth has come from the foreign-born, going from 40% of foreign-born Hispanics saying they use the internet to 52% in our most recent survey. And there is definitely a correlation between English proficiency and use of the internet. Yet some of the biggest growth in terms of the internet has occurred among those whose English proficiency levels are relatively lower. Next slide. Of course, one of the big questions is, what about broadband use? Among home internet users, what share actually use the internet? Uh, at, I'm sorry, what share of home internet users have a broadband connection? And you'll see for all groups, there's been tremendous growth in this between 2006 and 2008. Next slide. And what we see, particularly among different groups of Hispanics, is a similar story. Once again, next slide. You'll see that some of the biggest growth has been coming from particularly the foreign born, but also the native born too. Um, so we're seeing this growth in broadband use. It's pretty widespread across most demographic groups of Hispanics. Next slide. Now, one other thing that distinguishes Hispanics from other groups is their use of cell phones, their use of, 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 of cell phone technology to access the internet. But if you take a look at data from the federal government, 28% of all Hispanics actually live in wireless-only households. There's no landline phone in their homes. And they actually are the ones most likely to be living in such households compared to whites and blacks. And that number has been growing tremendously, and quite rapidly, actually, in recent years. Now, what does this mean? Next slide. When you ask folks who accesses the internet wirelessly, who actually is, what, what share of all adults are saying that they access the internet with a wireless device? Hispanics are in the lead. 62% of Hispanics in a recent survey in December of 2008 said that they access the internet through a wireless device. That's more than you see for blacks and more than you see for whites. 
Next slide. I'm going to stop there because uh, I had a very short time to do some numbers, but I hope that this was helpful and that it was useful. Of course, any questions that you might have relating to any of the work that we do at the Pew Hispanic Center, I'd be more than happy to answer anything. So thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. That was uh, fascinating. And I think that it will be a very good addition to our discussion on this panel. The way that I'm going to do this is I'm going to throw out a couple of questions for each of the panelists. But I would also like the panelists to feel free to jump in on other issues if they feel like there's an important point that needs to be made so that it can be a little bit more interactive. I would love to start with you, Tom, uh, and Maldives' role in the census and in making sure that the, that the message gets out, um, obviously because it has great um, uh, issues in terms of redistricting and other uh, issues that Maldives is, is involved in. One of the things that we've seen lately that I have been very concerned about is minority groups going out and telling minority groups to stay home. And I think that that is something that is hu a huge disservice to our community. And I would love to just get your thoughts on, on what Maldives can do and, frankly, what other groups in, in your space can do to make sure that that doesn't happen. And what are the repercussions? Well, I think that we need to explain as often as possible with as many different spokespeople as possible how important it is to be counted. And we need to explain why that particular approach, asking for a boycott, is so counterproductive to our community. It really is an attempt to shoot yourself in the head in order to attain something that you want, because it's that damaging to our community. I, I want to again acknowledge uh, Susan Gonzalez and Comcast for the efforts that they're uh, putting together with us to get the word out and make people understand that it's safe, it's simple, and it's important that everyone be counted. I think that we also have to get the message out, particularly in response to those who would ask people to not be counted for reasons uh, of trying to obtain some policy change, that this is really a civil rights issue. It's a civil rights issue to be counted. Everyone has the right to be counted. And like other civil rights issues, there are folks out there who want to take that right away from our community. There are folks out there who tried to put a citizenship question on the census form that was entirely about discouraging Latinos from being counted, that was entirely about trying to prevent us from exercising that civil right. And they're not going to stop there. There are others who will try to do other things to deter Latinos from either being counted or having their actual count taken into account when we decide where congressional seats should go and the like. This is a civil rights issue also because it determines how so many things are important to people mm -hmm. get distributed, so government services. I mean, I've told folks that if you care about anything, you care about education, if you care about housing, if you care about parks and recreation, mm -hmm. if you care about uh, senior citizen services, if you care about political representation, if you care about employment, if you care about any of these civil rights issues, mm -hmm. the most important thing anyone in our community can do in 2010, at least in the first three months, <laughs> is to make sure that them, their family members, their neighbors, their coworkers, everyone is counted and exercises the civil right to be counted. Great, thank you. And uh, Mr. Avila, in terms of your work with Maldif, what do you think are going to be the, the key issues in regards with the census um, that are the greatest challenges uh, with redistricting? And where do you think are going to be the states um, that Latinos have most to gain? Well, I think that uh, it's very important to point out, first of all, uh, that there's a lot of history mm -hmm. here in this room. Um, the issue of voting rights is not something that just uh, occurred uh, back uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, it's an issue that's been fought in our community since the 1800s. Uh, and uh, probably the most significant accomplishment that, uh, that MALDEF and other organizations like uh, LULAC and the American GI Forum and, and so on had was extending the Federal Voting Rights Act to Texas in 1975. And, um, and as I said before, uh, part of that history is here. Uh, Tom Reston, who was uh, introducing Tom, uh, was a member of Hogan and Hartson, who wrote a very instrumental briefing and provided advice to Vilma Martinez, our president and general counsel. Um, and I was very privileged and very uh, surprised and very happy to see Rick Swartz, who was also an attorney involved in that effort as well. Um, the census is so important uh, for purposes of redistricting and reapportionment. Congressional seats are going to be allocated. Mm -hmm. And if we engage, or even if people start to engage in a boycott, it means a loss of seats. It means a loss of, of, uh, of resources. And 
I think that, you know, following up on what Tom just said, I, I think the people that are advocating the boycott haven't really thought it through. Um, assuming that they're successful, assuming that, they're even, that there is some kind of immigration reform, what happens after the boycott? It, the, the, the numbers are only be, going to be counted only one time. So in, it will forever fix, for, for about 10 years, it will fix the distribution formulas. The, the other topic, uh, why the census is so important, is because it deals with the issue of voting rights. Uh, voting rights is so important, uh, it deals not only just with the distribution of resources, it also is a, a very uh, excellent avenue for the development of leadership within our community. And unfortunately, we have racism in our electoral system. We have racially polarized voting. That is, when people vote one way, uh, let's say Latinos vote one way and non-Latinos vote another way, for a variety of different reasons. And the biggest obstacle that we have in this country, apart from our redistricting, apart from the exclusions of, of uh, uh, non-citizens from participating in our uh, political process, is the issue of at-large elections and racially polarized voting. And the census plays a very important role in that because it identifies communities and it permits us to to conduct the kind of racially polarized voting analysis that we need to do. And one, just one final point, uh, I, I think Maldef, uh, I've been involved with Maldef since 1974, and uh, I've seen it grown, and I can really just happily say that, you know, the organization is an institution. It's an institution that's going to leverage with other institutions, and as Congress, the congressman Becerra said, uh, said earlier, we have to work with other organizations and to leverage, we have to develop within our own to, uh, to, to make sure that we can advocate for our efforts. I think that's right. Certainly, I, everybody in this room knows that all of these issues that we are undertaking as a community, we can't do alone. It, it's got to be a coalition, a partnership, an alliance of everybody in this room and other organizations that we all work with. So I, I, I agree with you, um, Dr. Avila. Thank you. Uh, my next question is for uh, Dr. Lemus. And, <laughs> Please feel free to comment on the question of the census because working alongside uh, Secretary Solis, you all know firsthand how this money gets distributed and to what communities. Incredibly important money which goes to employment programs that we all know benefit our communities. So I would love to hear your thoughts on that. But also, clearly in the political discourse today, we see that, that the, the White House and, um, and our elected officials need to, and I know they have been, uh, quickly pivoting to talk about jobs and the recovery. And so my question to you is, the issue of unemployment, clearly we always hear that Latino unemployment is higher than uh, mainstream um, unemployment. So would love to see, get your thoughts on why that is, what are the distinctions, and what can we do about it? Easy question. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, first off. Um, on behalf of the administration, I want to thank Maldiv for inviting me to participate in this um, in my prior life as a civil rights advocate. Maldiv was very important to us, um, to all of our organizations. And secondly, I wish to bring greetings from our secretary, who is actually on her way to Bolivia, heading a delegation uh, for Evo Morales' um, inauguration. But to your point on unemployment, um, you know, since uh, President Obama took office a year ago, uh, basically, as you've heard repeatedly, this we faced unparalleled challenges with regards to jobs. Um, our economy was in a free fall. Job losses uh, of more than 700,000 a month uh, were being compounded by ongoing issues. We heard about foreclosures and housing and, and issues related to stagnant wages, et cetera, Latinos being injured on the job. I mean, it's a laundry list and it's a litany. Uh, we took on the Recovery Act, and really it's something that the Department of Labor plays a, an important role in. Uh, the census does play a role also in getting us our basic funding so that we can help get employment training funds allocated to states. Uh, but there has to be a combination, I think, of political will along with the actual resources in place. Um, I want to share some data with you because um, I think it's, it's important to understand where we're at. We, we know that national unemployment has peaked. Um, and I believe we're a little over 10% at this point. Um, but 
This is a unique moment in history. We haven't faced anything like this since the Great Depression, and thankfully, we've averted another one. And um, when, you, when you hear these numbers, 9.1 million workers are working part-time, but they want a full-time job. Two million are marginally attached. They're available for work, but for some reason or another, uh, have not been able to gain more work or, or even to search for it. Um, it's about 706,000. This is as of, these are November numbers, late November, that are estimated to have just become so discouraged they've just flat out given up. Now, I think this, this needs a sort of a context. Since December of 07, we've lost 7.2 million jobs. Um, there, there is reason for optimism, I think, though. I mean, we have seen changes, you know, with some stabilization, manufacturing orders are increasing, et cetera. But this coming back is still, we're still not, we're not there yet. And you know it, and we know it, and we're aware of it, and we're trying to do everything we can about it. But I want to remind you of something, because this is important. We had last recession, it, uh, at February 01 to February 05, it took, from the last recession, which was a short recession, it took four years to recover jobs lost in one of the shortest and mildest recessions, where we only lost about 2.7 million jobs. We believe and we estimate at the Department of Labor it will probably take close to 10, 10 years to recover that. That's a long recovery process. Now, we just said it, Latinos suffer from higher unemployment. Um, we entered the recession early, and we felt it severely. Um, overall, employment in areas, because this is also about industries, construction, uh, it's uh, down by 13%. But among Latinos, and I think we may have even borrowed this in combination, worked with the Pew on this one, it's uh, Latinos in construction is down by 23%. So when you look at then complicated issues, poverty, 23% of Latinos lived below the poverty line uh, last year. This is up from 21.5% in 07. So right away, you know, um, this, this is complicated. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring up Puerto Rico specifically because it's really been in recession for the longest. Um, the average, the statement is it's about three years been in recession, really it's closer to six. And in September of 08, and these are not the latest statistics because there's been a spike, uh, it was 16.2%. Um, that's that's uh, pretty high. And uh, I'm sorry, it was in September of 08, it was 12%. By, by September of 09, it was 16.2%. Um, the Puerto Rican government is facing a $3.2 billion deficit. And um, when you think about it in comparison to a state like California, it's significantly worse. So I can go on and depress you, or I can talk to you <laughs> about how what we're going to do to um, let's do that. Get on a more positive line here. Um, so when Secretary Solis takes on the difficult job of being the Secretary of Labor, um, she really came into it and created a mantra for all of us. And our mantra is good jobs for everyone. What is a good job? A good job is a safe job. It's a job where you have the right to organize if you so choose, where you have the right to speak out, where you feel secure, and where um, you have a voice with your employer. And that's important. Um, but in 2009, we paid out close to $44.3 billion in Recovery Act funds. Uh, 2.8 billion alone was distributed to 32 states for unemployment insurance modernization, which is important because what that does is that helps people get their money faster and more effectively and really have that quick turnaround time so that even if, if you just add you know, uh, a little bit in your paycheck, it makes the difference between losing your home and, and making very difficult choices that we all know. Um, there's other things. Uh, we had, you've heard about our green grants rollout. Well, just so you know, we've released just this month close to half a billion dollars in green grants, Recovery Act funds. In fact, today I believe we released another 190 million for states. So this is all very important because um, I'm sure we'll end up talking about green jobs at some point. And, um, but there's another thing too, because we also know that Latinos really have difficulty in the workplace, that we are, more likely to be injured on the job, more likely to 
die on the job. And so this is something that the secretary was very clear on. She's added, uh, the other issue is wage and hour discrimination. Serious challenges with wage and hour. Um, she's added inspectors. I believe we've added 100 more OSHA inspectors and 250 more wage an hour, or we're in the process of adding. And also, just bear in mind that it's also about ensuring that there is diversity within the Department of Labor. And we are looking very closely at how we can assist in increasing the numbers, not only of Latinos, which is very critical, but of other underrepresented groups, such as the disabled. We have very low number of disabilities, uh, persons with disabilities. So these are all very important things, but in terms of work safety, uh, we've inspected workplaces for 5.4 million workers. Um, we've recovered monies through our wage and hour efforts of about 137.6 million for 175,000 workers. See, and that's the thing. If the Department of Labor is working effectively, then we can ensure that everyone has not only a safe workplace, but that they get what they deserve. Absolutely. Thank you, Gabby. That's, uh, that's very important work you're doing. Keep the grants coming. i um, my best. <laughs> but that you gotta talk to the members. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely, we will do that. Uh, Lillian, one of the things that I wanted to ask you as the head of NHLA, and uh, clearly this is a, an incredibly important group that serves as the umbrella for many Latino advocacy organizations dealing with a myriad of issues, all of which I think we're discussing around the table. Um, what do you see are the key issues that are facing Latinos, and I'll sort of answer my own question, healthcare being one of them. Um, I, what do you see, how do you see NHLA um, playing a role in advocating, for example, in, in health care reform or what may happen with health care reform now in terms of the millions of uh, Latinos who would benefit from this and the millions of Latinos who we, we need our elected officials to ur urgently understand need some help on this? Wow. I think Gabby's right. I think there's like seven questions in there, and you're just like, you, and see, I Absolutely. came with no paper. <laughs> first, first, I want to say a, a slight disclaimer because I think NHLA, the National Hispanic Leadership Agenda, works on a lot of issues, mm -hmm. um, and they're all equally important to us, but we do have to prioritize them. Um, a lot of work was, um, a lot of time was spent in late 09 and early 10 really looking at you know, the new White House, uh, preparing a blueprint um, that was given at the various conventions and made available to a lot of the folks here. Um, but in addition to that, looking at the appointment process and trying to weigh in on that and the departments and the secretaries. And then from there, we kind of transitioned uh, very quickly into um, the appointment of Sonia Sotomayor mm -hmm. um, to Supreme Court. And then from there, you know, with a, a minor hiccup, have been looking at health care. Somebody, somebody asked me just this week, they said, well, what would the study show us as the priorities for the Latino community? I kind of laughed because I said, they're the same as everything that everybody else cares about. Mm -hmm. Education, health care, housing, civil rights, um, economic development, so workforce development, and then you know, and there are other ones. I mean, this year we're also focused and we're looking at um, census. You have redistricting. But the point is that, you know, in each one of those categories or areas, policy areas, then you have a whole slew of other things. So as it comes, um, when we think about health care reform, we've been focused on um, the verification requirements. We've been focused on, first of all, we started with the public health option, discussing that, understanding that. We've been looking at the participation of Puerto Rico in the exchange and whether or not they would have increased uh, funding for the territories. And then, you know, obviously the lifting of the, of the ban um, uh, for uh, the five-year ban for legal permanent residents. And, and if we look at education, we'd be looking at, we would look at the dropout rate, um, the achievement gap overall, um, whether or not we have enough youth leadership. So I think there's, there's all of these, these wonderful and important issues that we need to focus on. And so I just want to put that into context that it's not one more important than the other. It's just about timing and sort of where the attention needs to be as we focus not only on regional issues and local issues, but really what's happening in Washington, D.C. and federal policy. What is our strength? Um, and, and how do we work? 
I think that a lot of the strength and the focus of the National Hispanic Leadership Agenda really is around raising the bar and the influence and the knowledge about the issues that affect our communities at the local level. So what we need to do is bring attention, and, and, and let's talk about census, because I think census is, is a good issue, um, and so is healthcare reform, so we could talk about either one. But it's, in my experience, I find that not enough information and resources makes it down to the local grassroots community. And people do care, but they can't be reliant just on sometimes the misinformation or the slanted view of, of some of the media outlets, not all of the media outlets, but some of the media outlets that are out there. And our um, media outlets, which are critically important, are oftentimes under-resourced. So it's hard for them to continuously track a lot of this information. So we need to drive information down to our communities and to the people who really are gonna be affected by this. At the federal level, the most important thing that we have is we need to work together and we need to leverage our influence. So we don't always agree on everything, my friends, and I think that we <laughs> probably have at least half of the NHLA membership in this room, Maldef being a member in NPRC and LULAC is here and, and NCLR and federal um, employees and, and just Naleo if, if, and Christina's here, so I, don't, I'm, I apologize because I'm gonna get kicked for just even starting to go through the groups. <laughs> but it's 30 important organizations. And so what happens is, as a community, we have to have some meeting of the minds. Mm -hmm. We have to. We have to start looking at what other communities are doing you know the communities I'm talking about. If you want me to out them, I'm not known for being PC. But we can look at what the African American community is doing and what the Jewish community is doing and saying they work very hard to identify issues that they deeply care about. They, they tear them. So where we can come to agreement, we come to agreement. And they drive an agenda around those issues. And that is the strength and could be as we continue to grow and work together because it is a learning process, the strength of the work that NHLA has been doing. Because around Sonia Sotomayor, we said, this is it. This is the person, this is the candidate. Mm -hmm. If we want to argue or we have little things that we want to discuss, we keep it behind closed doors and then we create a uniform public vision. And that's what we're about. That's what I'm about at the Federation. It's about creating a collective vision for our community and driving progress and success. And so NHLA has to do it because we have to look at what are our demographics, what is our geography, what are our issue areas, and also what are our strengths. Mm -hmm. None Absolutely. of us comes in and pretends, and I certainly will not, come in and pretend to be a expert on every single issue. I'm gonna leave a lot of the stuff to Tom. <laughs> and I'll leave it to other members to say, this is what we know, this is what we do. But when people do educate us and say, this is critical and this is the impact on our community and for these reasons, I challenge us to fall in line and flank behind. And then we will have progress. And so that's the power of NHLA. Great, and on a final note, my friends, if you ask me what are the activities or techniques, and I have to say this, there is caring and there is caring. And we cannot care from our bedrooms or in front of CNN and say, I care so much about this, this is terrible. Caring yes. is when mm -hmm. people get up at five o'clock in the morning and get on trains or buses and say, I've been asked to be somewhere, to be a voice, to take a stand, and then they're there. Yeah, agreed. Thank you, Lillian. Yes. Mark, I wanted to ask you a little bit about what I believe is, is a new but uh, an emerging but incredibly important issue and debate mm -hmm. in our community. And, and, and you, you talked about it in some of your slides in terms of internet adoption, mm -hmm. broadband access mm -hmm. uh, for the Latino community, as we are now uh, at the verge of being um, the fastest adopters and, and the biggest users of wireless. Mm -hmm. So in, in your, what have you seen um, in, in your world uh, empirically uh, in terms of how the Latino community can play a role in this debate? We know that the mm -hmm. FCC is about to put together mm -hmm. a broadband plan. Uh, how do you see us defining this debate for our community mm -hmm. before others define it for us? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. Um, 
uh, it's um, it's hard for me, me from the Pew Hispanic Center to talk about specific policy, but let me talk sure. a little bit about facts and what sure. we know about this. Certainly, Latinos lag in terms of both um, uh, use of the internet mm -hmm. and also uh, use of broadband at home. They lag a little bit in some cases, lag more in others. But one of the striking things I think that you see is you have a couple of things going on with the Latino community. So many young people, because there are so many young people, that's actually affecting the ways in which Latinos use the internet. And I always worry that when we ask questions about how people use the internet on surveys, we're kind of a little bit late already for making it into a survey. <laughs> and so trying to figure out the ways in which people actually use the internet and how they use it and what they use it for is something that we're trying to do at the center a little bit more of. But I think one of the strengths of the Latino community is that it's young. And one of the reasons why you see so much Latinos in the lead in terms of accessing the internet wirelessly is because there's so many young people. And that's partly driving the story uh, uh, for Latinos. More generally speaking, though, uh, our data suggests that there's been a lot of gains in terms of access, particularly among um, uh, Latinos who are the groups perhaps that have lagged behind the most. Those who are those who are not necessarily English speakers, yeah. those who uh, are are are, um, are older, those who are um, uh, not native born. Yeah. That's where we've seen some of the real lagging in terms of, of access. But on all of those fronts, according to our data, we've seen some tremendous gains made, and more and more Latinos are using. Uh, the internet for a multitude of purposes, whether that's to look up information about health, whether that's to read news online, whether that's to, to just communicate with other folks. Mm -hmm. With regards to um, um, uh, Latinos and internet content, I think that yes, Hispanics can drive internet content, but one of the things I think you've seen is that a lot of internet content is actually um, uh, in, in English, much more so to be in English, and that explains part of the reason why I think some non-English speakers aren't necessarily gravitating to the internet. But as media begins to discuss and think about the different ways in which it can reach out to the Latino community, I think that we're going to see in the coming years just a lot of new efforts to reach out to Hispanics on the internet, mm -hmm. sometimes in bilingual ways, sometimes just in English, sometimes just in Spanish. But there are many things in the works, I think, that are going to get more Latinos online. Great. Uh, certainly, the uh, the rise of the Latino bloggers has been uh, something that we have seen, and yes. and we, like you said, we need to take advantage of those types of communications for all of our advocacy efforts. I think, I'm going to do one last question because I think we're running upon the um, our deadline here, but and, and it's to your point, Lillian, in terms of of making sure that we have a united front on the key issues that are facing our community, um, and and Tom and Joaquin would love to get your thoughts on this. Here's, here's my, f my fear, but also my excitement. I, I really believe that once we start getting the numbers back from this year's census, our community is once again going to see huge growth. If you all think that people went after us during the Sonia Sotomayor confirmation, you just wait <laughs> until they see our numbers. And so would love to get a sense from you as to what it is that we can do to perhaps start laying the groundwork to make sure that that, it, that kind of discourse is civil, that that is a, um, a, a, a dialogue that we continue to have with, with other communities, with our elected officials, so that they understand that we do have a united front and that it is not acceptable for, acceptable for them to be able to come after this, us the way they have in, in other debates. Well, um, that's an excellent question. Um, it reminds me of uh, some of the cases where we get involved in challenging at-large election systems, where we often go to a community and you have like a 10% Latino population, and there might be one Latino elected official to the city council. Mm -hmm. um, they're not perceived as a threat. The local community uh, doesn't really engage in any kind of rancorous mm -hmm. uh, rants about racism and so on. But then, that percentage starts to increase to 30 or 40 percent. And you, then you see all of this coming out of the woodwork. And that's jet, that was so true in California mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. Proposition 187, 209, et cetera, where you have increased participation, increased political clout uh, as a result of census uh, reallocations of congressional seats from the Northeast and uh, the Midwest to the South and the Southwest you start to see a, a, a visceral reaction against that. And uh, it, it's part of our history, yeah. and it continues to be so. So I think that one way of uh, combating that is to strengthen our institutions mm -hmm. um, and to make sure that information continues to be 
a very powerful advocacy issue uh, because without information, uh, we're, we're essentially invisible. Mm -hmm. can, can I add something Absolutely. to this? Um, uh, there, a new survey from the Pew Research Center for the People in the Press that was done of, uh, of all Americans asking them about progress that's been made in race relations mm -hmm. found the following result. It turns out that Americans generally think that the number one group that's discriminated against in terms of race and ethnicity are Hispanic Americans. 23% of all Americans identified Hispanic Americans as the most discriminated group in the United States today. Um, that's ahead of African Americans at 18%. Among African Americans, they see themselves as the most discriminated against, but whites are more likely to see Hispanics as the group that's discriminated against the most in the United States. That's amazing. And, uh, can I? Please, please. Um, I think one of the things that we haven't touched on is, as it relates to, as you said, um, having what I call Latinos under siege mm -hmm. is the rising tide of violence and hate crimes mm -hmm. against our community mm -hmm. that have resulted in many deaths. And, you know, this is not happening in some of the most remote areas um, of the country where you would say, well, they, they don't have recognition, they don't have knowledge. I mean, this is happening in shameful places like my state, um, New York, and also in Pennsylvania, right? So we're all in the Northeast saying, what is going on in these communities? And I just wanna mention that because it goes back to um, what Maria is mentioning about being, you know, having this discourse that reaches these very ugly levels. I mean, I think the campaign that a lot of people in this room did around Lou Dobbs was very important and very mm -hmm. powerful mm -hmm. because it said we will not stand for it. That's the kind of work that we need to continue to do. It's not the only work, but it is some of the work that we need to do. The work that the legal defense funds have been engaged in, MALDEF and Puerto Rican Legal Defense Fund, a challenge which you said is critically important. We need to keep our institutions strong. Because part of the problem that we have is people will say, well, where's the Latino voice on healthcare reform? Mm -hmm. Or where's the Latino voice on education? Or why is there only one Latino in the room talking policy or discussing this issue or representing you? Hello, people are not funding us for public policy advocacy. They want us to do a lot of program and program services, and that's critically important. But at the end of the day, everyone else, a lot of the progressive money and a lot of the other money is going into these very large mainstream organizations because they really understand public policy, my friends, and we don't. So we're not getting funded. We don't have a seat at the table. And my experience has been, and it's limited, but I'm getting up there, folks, in terms of age, is if I'm not in that room, <laughs> in part of that dialogue, shaping, mm -hmm. framing the issues, then the proposals and the initiatives and the policy that comes out, ya está planchado. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's our challenge, to get some of that important money, progressive money, whatever money, because all money is green, into our institution so we can do public policy, yes. we can do advocacy, we can do end. research, mm -hmm. we can do legal defense and say, we, ma we matter, we have a voice, we need to be respected, this is what we need, this is what we want. We're in partnership, but we have to be respected as a community. And we'll get there. Absolutely, thank you. Can Gabby, just, yes, please. Yeah. Just also that, uh, you know, that's part of what we do at the Department of Labor as well. It's a much, it's not so blunt. It's not, you know, um, the murder of a person in uh, an awkward situation or beyond awkward uh, or, or uh, a legal situation, but it is abuse. And it's the kind of exploitation that needs to be stopped. And, and really, I think, um, to your point, when you have people in place who really care, about the workers and about what's happening, but also about the employers who are doing a good job and who are ensuring that, that they are uh, doing the right thing and making sure that their workforce is well treated and that they have what they need, then you really have a compliment. And um, sometimes civil rights issues aren't really big. Sometimes they're really small. And it's that ability to speak out in your workplace and say, you know what, what you're doing isn't right and not having retaliation. I think oh, it's a great question. There is a tremendous amount of fear of the fact that we're a growing mm -hmm. community. But when you sit back and think about why are they afraid, uh, I think that the part of it is, frankly, that they expect us, when we're the majority, to treat them the way they treated us. 
um, when they were the majority. And so I think there's two contradictory, somewhat contradictory things that we need to do. I mean, number one, this is already happening. There are cities and even states where the Latino population is huge and really is the governing majority. And we have to use our media contacts and other means to get the message out that we're responsible governors, yes. that we are responsible yes. decision makers, that we're not going to run things the way the last majority ran things, uh, that we're not going to be all for, about what's good for our group and our group alone. Mm -hmm. But then the somewhat contradictory thing, and it, it I think reinforces what has already been said, is that we have to make it clear that we care about these issues. That's right. I mean, our community votes overwhelmingly, not the same as the African American community, but votes overwhelmingly for one party. Mm -hmm. And that party takes us for granted. Mm -hmm. They still do. <laughs> they still do. Uh, even after the contribution that we made a year ago, they still take us for granted. And that's because, in my experience, they get political advice from folks who are operating on knowledge that is 15 years old or older. They make assumptions about how our community will act, about what we will accept, about what we care about. And we have to contradict those stereotypes at every opportunity and make it clear that as a community, we care about language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We care about a discourse that's coarsened with references to people being illegal. I've often thought, and I've actually said, that we should start calling them unconstitutionals. If they want to define some group of us <laughs> by one act and then use that adjective to describe people, well, then I want to start calling them unconstitutionals. Lou Dobbs is an unconstitutional, <laughs> and we should do something about him. Sheriff Arpaio is an unconstitutional, mm -hmm. and we should do something about him. Well, we so got we rid of Lou Dobbs to, already, so. We have to make it clear. Well, come back. We have to make clear that we care about these issues, yeah. and we care about language, and that we will hold people accountable for the language that they use. And as I said in my, in my opening remarks, it's not just about language. Mm -hmm. It's also about what they do while they're saying, oh, don't worry about it. We're going to fix it later. I'm sorry, but I can't accept a health care reform that says that being undocumented is a worse crime than any other, such that we would do what we have never done to the most violent criminal or to the worst white-collar criminal, which is say to them, you cannot use your own money to go into our capitalist system and purchase insurance for yourself and your family. That is unacceptable as a symbolic statement by our leadership. And, and even if they say it in the nicest language, we have to step forward and say, no, we will not accept that, and we will hold you accountable. We gave you our votes a year ago. Now we expect you to deliver in every way. I think we've reached our time limit, so I want to thank everybody for joining us here today for this very spirited discussion, and I hope that it, it, it will continue. These are certainly issues that everybody needs to be discussing. I think one of the things that will also help to diminish the fear that, that Tom talks about and that is very real is for America to understand that we look like them, they look like us, because our issues are the same. So we need to be talking about our issues. We need to make, make sure that, that Gabby is on TV more, Tom is on TV more, I'm doing more TV. Everybody is making sure that we are communicating our message of our community and that our agenda is the American agenda. So thank you, everybody, for everything you do.